everyone. Today I'm going to talk about structural diaphragm design. A diaphragm is a large, thin structural element and loaded in plan. A diaphragm is consists of sheathing, framing members that support the sheathing, such as joints, blocking, and the perimeter element, including cores and collectors. And we should follow those, the uh, stated design procedure as shown here. First, we have to determine the sheathing thickness based on gravity load, which is normal to sheathing. It is the same schedule as we have done for structural panel design. Uh, secondly, we have to determine the nailing or blocking requirements based on wind load and seismic load. Thirdly, we want to determine maximum forces in cores and collectors. And based on those maximum forces, we are going to design the members as a tension member or a compression member. Then we have to check the total diaphragm deflection and check the tie and anchorage requirement. Here is an example showing a second floor of a retail sales building. So the joists in, in the floor spaced at 24 inches on standard. And the panels have been placed with a grand direction perpendicular to the joist. Or we can say it's placed in strong direction. The floor sheathing will be rated the structure one. We assume a total dead load of 20 PSF. Uh, and the life load can be fined from ASC7, a minimum life load. So uh, we're going to design the diaphragm with a load combination of dead load plus life load. Okay, the wind load already given as 450 pound per linear foot. Okay, so we want to check if the wind load either in the transverse direction or in the longitudinal direction. Okay. As we have talked about, the step one going to be determine the panel span rating and minimum thickness. So it is the same as we, we did for the structural panel design. Right, so dead load, minimum life load uh, is 75 PSF, dead load 20 PSF, uh, based on the SC7, table 4.3-1, page 16. Uh, and from reference one for structural panels, we can find out the uh, uniform load for life load based on the deflection L over 360, and the total uniform load based on the total load for deflection of L by 240 and bending and shear. Seeing, okay, so this is the reference one for structural panels, right? So since we are structural one sheathing, so table 1B would be used to find out the, uh, the span rating, right? So the span the joints span at, span at the spacing of 24. So it's the flooring system, part of the flooring system. So 48 by 24 would be selected. Spacing at 24 inches on center. So those are the uniform loading values. Okay. So uh, there we know the life load, uh, uniform loading, allowable uniform loading is 191 PSF. Total load, 286 PSF. Bending, 208 PSF. Shear, 404 PSF. Applied life load, 75 PSF. Total load, 95 PSF. So the allowable, the allowable Uniform loading are all greater than the uh, applied load, so we're okay for the loading capacity. And from the reference to table 11, so uh, this is the reference 
two, right? From the reference two, panel design specification table 11. we can find out the minimum thickness for span rating of 48 by 24, which is 23 over 32 inch. Okay. So that way we determine the minimum thickness for the sheathing. Okay. So it is the same as we did for the structural panel design. So sheathing actually isn't a panel, it's a combination of panels. All right. Uh, next step, we want to find the required panel nailing. Okay. All right. uh, so the nailing system is based on the shear on the edges, right? So we want to find the shear. So if we consider the wind load is on the transverse direction. Okay. So wind load is on the transverse direction. So it's like a simple supported beam on the transverse direction. So let's draw a graph here. This is a diaphragm and loading in the transverse direction, right? So the loading linear load is four hundred fifty pound per foot. So it's actually like a simple supported D beam. Uh, and the shear at the edges should be equal, the total shear force at the edges should be equal to the reaction. Right, so we can find out the reaction. Right, so the reaction is, or the total shear force at the edges should be equal to 450 PLF, Time the span length. The span length is uh, eighty feet. So and uh, the width of the diaphragm is thirty five feet. Um, V is 450 PLF times the total length 80 feet divided by 2, which is equal to 18,000 pound. Okay. Uh, and so at the edges, 
the total shear force. Uh, we can convert convert the total shear force to a uh, unit shear along the edges. We have very big uh, width. So the unit shear unit shear at edges would be equal to the total shear force So divided by the width, which is 35 feet, okay, and is equal to 514 pound per linear foot. Okay. So determine the spacing at the diaphragm boundaries. Uh, so when we talk about diaphragm boundaries, so those, the four edges are called diaphragm boundaries. Uh, so, we don't know it should be blocked or unblocked yet. So, let's see if it could be designed as an unblocked wood structure to save some uh, money. Okay. So, assume It is an unblocked uh, diaphragm. Okay. Uh, and so this one This is the uh, applied applied unit shear. So we want to find out the uh, allowable unit shear from the code, right? So we want to find find uh, allowable unit shear from uh, S DPWS. Table Table four point two C. So four point two C is for unblock the structural diaphragm. Okay, so page uh, twenty three.
So let's go to SDPWS table. Uh, so special design provisions for wing and seismic. Special design provisions, okay. Um, table of contents. So let's look at chapter four, lateral force resistance systems. Uh, and for section 4.2. Okay. So table 4.2 provides allowable unit shear for the panels. Rotate. Okay. So 4.2a is for the blood wood structural panels. 4.2c is for the unblocked wood structural panel diagrams. So it gives us the uh, the common nail size and its minimum fastener penetration and the minimum nominal panel thickness and the minimum nominal width of the of the lumber at the boundaries. And gives us those are the uh, unit allowable unit shear on the seismic load and the un allowable unit shear on the wind load for uh, the spacing of six inches. Nailing uh, nailing spacing of six inches on sender at the boundaries. So the unit shear for case one and the unit shear for case two to eight. Uh, let's zoom in. Okay, so those are the illustration of the different cases. So case one and three is uh, for continuous panel joint perpendicular to framing. So this is the continuous panel joint. And in this direction, the joint is not continuous, means it's not in a line, so it's not continuous. So in the long direction, the joint is continuous and it's perpendicular to the to the joints, right? And this and this one is the same, right? So uh, continuous joint is perpendicular to the framing, right? So when wind is blowing in the direction of parallel, in the direction parallel to, to the framing. So that's case one. And case two is uh, the wind direction is perpendicular to the framing system. Okay, so we, when uh, in under the transverse wind loading of our case, right, so wind is blowing in a direction perpendicular, uh, per parallel to the joist, Right, and uh, continuous joint is perpendicular to the joint. So uh, when wind is blowing this way, we are case one, case one, right? Okay, so once we determine the load case, we are able to find out the allowable unit, allowable unit shear. Right, so case one, case one for uh, nail size six D and uh, two by lumbers, the lumbar unit stress is four hundred sixty for A D nail six seventy for the ten D nail allowable shear stress shear stress is eight hundred. So however, you have to read the notes carefully. It says nominal unit shear capacity should be adjusted in accordance with 4.2.3 to determine ASD allowable unit shear capacity. So let's go back to section 4.2.3 in this book. Okay. 4.2. Point three. Uh, let's rotate it back. 
here. Okay. Okay. Um, so right here, uh, I wish I could highlight it. Okay, so please highlight this one. The ASD allowable unit shear capacity should be determined by dividing the tabulated nominal unit shear capacity modified by applicable footnotes. That is what we just read, footnote one, by the ASD reduction factor of two. Okay, so the real allowable sh unit shear capacity should be divided by two, should be the tabulated values divided by two. Okay. So. Right. So so the capacity is going to be those tabulated values divided by 2. Okay, let's see. Okay. So uh, okay, so we just determine that the framing qualifies as case 1. Uh, and we have uh, two by nominal number. Two by. Okay. Uh, and a wind load. Yeah. And we have wind load. So, uh, structural one sheathing. So the so the corresponding unit shear capacity for sixty mil would be. 460 PLF divided by 2, which is equal to 230 PLF. Uh, 8 D nails would be 670 divided by 2, which is equal to 335 PLF. Nail, 10 D nail. 800 PLF divided by 2, uh, 400 PLF. Okay. So this 2 is the safety factor. Based on SDPWS 4.2.3. Okay. Uh, and the applied, actually, they all all of them smaller than the applied load, five hundred fourteen PLF. Right, applied. So it's not good. So we have to apply the blocking to increase the unit shear capacity of the diaphragm.
So go back to the SDPWS menu. So table 4.2C is for unblocked wood structural panel. And table 4.2A is for blocked wood structural panel. Uh, as we can see here, uh, those values are much greater than up, unblocked wood structural panel, right? So uh, remember that the applied unit shear is 514. So those numbers has to be divided by twos and still greater than 514. This one would be too smaller, and uh, this number looks good. Right? Even if it's divided by two, it will be still good. Oh, this number. We have the two, two nominal numbers, so this number looks good. Okay, so it's nailing spacing at diaphragm boundaries for all cases. Uh, at continuous panel edges parallel to load for case three and four, and at all panel edges for case five and six. So nail spacing at diaphragm, diaphragm boundaries for case one would be four inches. At, so the nailing spacing at edges should be at least uh, four inches. And at the other Diaphragm edge is going to be uh, six. Okay. So the diaphragm boundary. So it means, so these four edges, so those are the four, are the diaphragm boundaries, right? So uh, any edges in the middle could have a spacing of six inches, but the spacing at the boundaries should be at least four inches on standard, right? Okay, so... Uh, we check table 4.2a of SDPWS menu, uh, which is for Blocked diaphragm. Okay. Um, and as we can see, ten D nail would be satisfied. So ten D nail. And four inch space nailing spacing at boundaries. And six inch spacing. at other edges, panel edges.
So the uh, allowable unit shear would be 1,190 PLF divided by 2, which is equal to 595 pound per linear foot. Uh, make sure it's greater than the applied unit shear. Okay, so we're good. Uh, and don't forget to che check the uh, minimum penetration. Okay, so if you and go back to the table, so right here, zoom it in a little bit. Okay, so for the from the table on your left hand side. Uh, you have to check the minimum fastener penetration in framing member or the blogging. So for the 10D nail, the minimum penetration should be one and a half inch, inches. And uh, the minimum nominal panel thickness should be 15 by 32. So we're good. We use 30, we'll use 23 over 32 inch, right? Okay. So we have to check the penetration. Uh, okay. So uh, minimum penetration. One and a half inches. Okay. Uh, and here, so panel is supported by by the framing. Okay. So uh, the tape, the length of the tapered tip would be two times the diameter. Okay. Uh, so the diameter could be found from the NSD table L4. Table page 182. Okay, there. So NDS table L4 gives us the uh, dimensions of uh, those typical nails. Okay, so the 10D have, nail has a length of three inches. Uh, D diameter is 0.14A. Okay, so with those number, we're able to calculate the penetration. Okay, so Nail size is in NDS table L four page one 
182. So the length of the nail uh, is the length of the nail is three inches, okay. and the D D is 0.148 inch. Okay. So we can calculate the penetration penetration is equal to the total length three inches minus minus the uh, thickness of the panel which is 23 over 32 inch okay. which is equal to And, and minus the uh, tapered tip, minus 2 times 0.148. So the penetration depth is equal to 1.99. So let's go back to look at the limitation. Is minimum uh, penetration is one and a half inches, right? So we are good. So, which is greater than one and a half inches, right? So we're we're good, right? Alright, so at uh, the boundaries, as we can see, at the boundaries, we the shear uh, is pretty big. So we have to use the blocking to obtain a higher shear capacity. However, if you look at the shear diagram of the diaphragm, you will see that the uh, shear is linearly decreasing and the shear will decrease down to zero in the middle. Okay, so, so you shear is maximum in the center, which is 414 PLF. So in the center of the diaphragm, it's zero. Right, so as we move into the center, move into the middle of the diaphragm, the shear would be, would be decreasing. So at a certain point, it will no longer need blocking. Right, so, uh, if we go back if we go back to the previous slide so for a So if 10D nails are used, uh, the capacity for an unblocked panel would be 400 PLF, right? So so 
So at a certain distance, let's say this point has a distance of x to the middle span. It will decrease down to 400. Shear, unit shear will decrease down to 400. And after that point, no blocking, no blockings are required after this distance. So, or within negative, negative. Okay. So, over this distance, no blocking. So the blocking is not required anymore. Okay. So to find, to be most cost effective, we want to find out x, the distance of x. So by using similar triangle, we will find out x is equal to 400 divided by 514 um, times 40, which is equal to 31 feet. So uh, approximately, so we say block 10 feet each side, right? And then, uh, 10 inch nail spacing unblocked. Okay, so uh, you can say block 10 feet each side. And the remaining lens in the middle could be unblocked. So that's going to be reduce the cost. Okay. Say, uh, block 10 feet. each side, then ten inch nail spacing. Unblock. So this is the case for trans transverse uh, loading. Okay. So So as for longitudinal loading, which is when load is blowing this way, okay? So for longitudinal, pick the, determine the size. So in longitudinal,
when loading. So that is when load uh, is blowing, this one. So now uh, it's like a simple supported beam. Uh, and it's also for behalf 450 PLF. Okay, uh, so in this case would be which case? So we have to find out uh, the uh, shear load, right? So the shear load would be in this direction, right? So. Shear. Um, so the shear force is going to be the same, 450 PLF. Uh, the span length now is 35 divided by 2. Right. Uh, so, and the unit shear is going to be the total shear. divided by the lens. So now the lens is 80. So it's divided by 80 foot. And we get a uh, unit shear of 224 PLF. So the unit shear along the edge is 224. Uh, so we also have to determine the allowable, uh, determine the allowable unit shear. Okay. So go back to, to the table. I'll scroll in again. So each time I have to forces to close. Okay. So go back to the table. Uh, let's see the blocked block the wood panel. Uh, that's gonna be so the wind is blowing in the longitudinal direction. So so we would be case three, right? So if you look at the table 4.2a uh, load case three. Okay. Load case three spacing. So if we still use ten D, ten D nail, it will be far bigger than apply uh, applied unit shear. So we. So to reduce the cost, we will look at the unblocked wood panel to see if it would meet the requirement for the unblocked panel. So case 3, 10D. Case 3. OK, for case 3, 10D is 600 divided by 2, so the allowable would be 300. Uh, so it would be perfectly fine for this problem. So the allowable unit shear uh, for 
unblocked. Diaphragm would be 600 PLF uh, and 10D nail divided by 2, 300 PLF. Okay, which is greater than the applied. Okay, so we are good. So it's good to use the uh, unblocked diaphragm for load is blowing in the longitudinal direction. Right? And Now, uh, we have determined the nailing spacing and the uh, minimum thickness of the sheathing. So next step is going to be determining the forces in the collectors and the cords. Forces. in cores and collectors under transverse loading. Um, okay, so then let's look at the analysis model. So the diaphragm uh, loading in the transverse direction. Four hundred fifty pound per linear foot, uh, and yeah. So with the width of D and the total length eighty. Okay, B is equal to thirty five feet. So when wind is blowing in the transverse direction, so the uh, the diaphragm would deflect like this, like in a beam, like in a simple supported beam, right? So uh, it would like a simple supported beam like this. Uh, so the moment and shear diagram will be like this. Okay. Um, so the uh, this cord, the cord here, is in tension, is in compression, and the, this cord would be uh, in in tension, right? So say tension cord uh, and compression cord, right? 
However, the wind could blow in from the other way. So the tension cord will become a compression cord and uh, compression cord will become tension cord. So for each cord, you have to check both for tension and compression because uh, when the load, the, when the direction of the wind load is changing, uh, it will switch back and forth from tension to compression. So you have to check tension and compression at the same time. Okay. Uh, so for the cord, So now we spend now we spend, spend a little bit time to derive the equations for determining determining the uh, the forces in the core. Okay, so say the cross section the cross section of the diaphragm would like this. Top cord, bottom cord, right, and a sheathing, say, is in the middle. Okay. Uh, say the the width, uh, say, is a thickness thickness of of the cord is T, and the thickness of the uh, sheathing is T1, uh, and the uh, center to center spacing of the two cord would be uh, B. Okay. So, uh, so based on the equation stress, so say the stress on at this point, at the center point of the cord would be equal to uh, maximum moment times the distance from the point to the neutral axis would be B divided by 2 and divided by moment inertia. Okay, So the moment of the inertia of the total would be equal to the moment of inertia of the cord about the x-x axis plus the moment of inertia of the web or of the sheathing. So I would be equal to the moment of inertia of the cord about x-axis. So, uh, so to calculate the moment of inertia of the cord about x-axis, we have to use a parallel axis theorem. So we have two cords, two, two times the moment of inertia uh, of the cord about its own axis. So which is equal to 12a times t cubic. And uh, move the axis to the neutral axis. So plus the area A, T, uh, and times A, T times the, the distance from the 
point to the neutral axis was going to be b over 2 squared. And the plus the moment inertia of the web, which or the sheathing, which is going to be 12 t1 times b minus t cubed. Uh, so t, as we can see, t is very small. t is very, very small. So t So t is very small, so this number is very small, and this item is also very small. So we assume I approximately equal to 2 times a d t times b over 2 squared. So substitute i into the equation, we will get e. Uh, sigma is equal to mx b over 2 i is 2 a t times b over 2 squared. Okay. So uh, 2 over b is cancelled out. Uh, and then the total of the force. So we use the stress at the center as an average stress for in the cord, in the cross section of the cord. So the total force in the cord would be equal to F. F is equal to the average, say it's an average stress times. Uh, the area of the cord, which is A times T. So, which is equal to uh, M max B over 2 times A T divided by 2 times A T uh, B over 2 squared, which is equal to M max divided by 2. Okay, so this is an approximate and simplified expression to calculate the force in the core. And the force, force in the top core should be equal to the force uh, in the bottom core because they are symmetrical. All right.
Okay. All right. So that way we are able to calculate the the forces in the cords. Okay. So uh, M max is equal to the linear load. 450 pound per linear foot uh, times the span length, which is 80 feet square, divided by A, which is equal to 360k foot. Uh, and the maximum tension in the cord would be uh, the maximum moment divided by V which is the, the width of the diaphragm, so which is equal to 360k foot divided by B, which is 35 feet, equal to 10.3 kips. Okay. So either tension or compression, so means uh, the maximum force in the cord, either in tension and compression, is equal to 10.3 kips. So, so in this, so in this slide, we determine the the force. So this is the maximum force in cord. Forces, force in the cords, okay? And then we also have to determine the, the forces transferred or carried by the collector, by the collector. Okay, so this is the, the collector, okay? Forces in collectors. So draw the uh, side view, draw the side view of, of the diaphragm of the building. It will be like this. And there's a window uh, and a door. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, so the total, the total lens 
the total length is 35. Okay, so the length of the collector, the collector of the length to collect is 20, 20 feet, right? Uh, and as we know, that's the, sh uh, the collector and the shear wall carrying the four, carry the shear forces, the shear force, unit shear. Right. Uh, under the lateral wind load. transverse wing load okay so if we just draw a portion of the collector draw the free body diagram okay so shear flow or the unit shear and the force in the cross section of the collector, uh, say the, with the length of X. Um, sum the force, sum the forces in the x direction, so you can solve for T C, which is equal to uh, so, and the unit shear apply the unit shear is five hundred fourteen PLF. C is equal to uh, V, which is the uh, the unit shear, applied unit shear, 514 PLF uh, times the uh, length. The total, le the total length of the collector is 20, 20 feet, which is equal to 10.3 pips. Means is in this direction is positive, so is compression. Um, so the total length, the maximum, uh, the shear, the shear force increase from zero, from zero, at the end, and the linear increase to its maximum, to the other end of the collector, which the maximum, a compression force going to be ten point three pips. Okay, so. Uh, the maximum tension force will be here, 10.3 hips, right? Uh, so when wind is blowing into the building, toward the building, the collector is in tension. When the wind is blowing away from the building, the collector should be in tension. Okay, so you need to check the collector for tension and for compression okay not just check uh, not just check compression or tension okay so if if wind is blowing away from the building, then TC 
is intention. All right. All right. Uh, so we have calculates the uh, the forces in the collector in the collector and in the cords for transverse wind loading. Okay. So next step gonna be calculating the forces in the cord and the collectors under longitudinal wind loading. Forces in chords and uh, collectors under longitudinal. Wind loading. Okay. Uh, so, as we just talked about, draw this figure again. So when load is blowing on the side of the building, we call it as, uh, longitudinal wind loading. Okay? So in this case, the simple supported beam would be like this. The wing load is also 450 PLF, right? And the span length is going to be 35 feet, right? So in this case, uh, so the short side is going to be the cord. So. This becomes the cord, cord, uh, and the long, uh, and the member in the long direction becomes the collector. So it's the same, we calculate the uh, maximum moment. The maximum moment would be like this, right? Uh, Mx is equal to omega L squared over A, right? So the maximum moment is equal to uh, the linear load will keep the same, 400, but the span length is 35, becomes uh, 35 feet squared divided by A equal to 69K foot. Uh, so we can calculate the uh, forces in, in the cord using the equation of M max divided by B. B is the length of the collector at this time. So Mx is 69k foot divided by B. V now becomes 80, 80 feet. So divided by 80. 
which is equal to 0.86 kips. All right. Uh, and similarly, we have to calculate the forces in the collector. In the collector. So let's draw the side view of the building. So which is uh, so we want to determine the force in for the collector, right? So if you go back to we have to determine the forces in the collectors here. Okay, so uh, draw a, draw a uh, side view when you look at this way. You look from this direction. Look at the uh, this side of the building. Okay, so draw like this the collector. So in this case, collector is the long side of the building. Okay, so we have a 15 inch shear wall and 45, uh, 45 15 feet, 15 feet uh, shear wall and 45 feet collectors or struck. And a twenty, another twenty feet shear wall. Right, so the core section. Okay. Uh, so the lens. Of the shear wall on one side is fifteen. The collectors in the middle is. Is 45 feet. The shear wall on the other side is 20. Okay, uh, and the uh, so the shear unit shear unit shear we calculated. is uh, 98 pound per linear foot. So this is the plan view. Plan view of the building. Okay, and uh, and if you want to draw the front view, the front view of the building, it will be like this. So this is the shear wall, shear wall, okay. Shear flow, unit shear. Okay. 
All right. So re uh, we recall the, uh, the structural analysis, right? So we have, uh, remember, it's in a simple supported beam like this. So the total, so the, the total shear along this side or along this side is 400 PLF uh, times 75 feet divided by two, which is equal to 7,875 pounds. And the unit shear gonna be the total shear force divided by the total length, which is 80. Okay. So, yeah. So it's gonna be, say, eighty feet. which is equal to 98 pound per linear foot. So we write it down here, okay? Uh, then let's check the uh, allowable. The allowable stress.
uh, as we have talked about before, uh, in here, we consider the shear wall take all the loading and the collector only responsible for transfer the loading from one shear wall to the other. Right? So, so the unit shear in the shear wall is going to be total 90 PLF times uh, times 80 okay, times 80 and it divided by the total length the total length of the shear wall gonna be 15 plus 20 which is equal to 224 per linear foot. So that is the, the shear forces in the shear wall. So the collector only responsible for transferring the load between these two shear, shear walls. Okay. And then let's draw the free bread diagram of the section. So cut, cut here. Let's say making a cut. If we make a cut here and draw the free bread diagram. So this is uh, 98 PLF and 224 PLF and uh, the lens, the lens of the shear wall is 15 feet and any arbitrary lens of the collector. So uh, TC is equal to Ninety eight times ninety eight times fifteen plus x minus two to four times fifteen, right? So, which is equal to ninety eight times x minus one thousand eight hundred and ninety, and x is in between zero and four d. Five. So uh, you can draw the the load distribution for the collector. So at the end on your right hand side, the shear force is one thousand nine hundred eight hundred ninety. On your right hand side, the shear force uh, would be. That's going to be in tension, so 200, 2,520 pounds. And it's linearly increased. See, so that is for the case wind is blowing. The wind is blowing this way, right? So when wind is blowing this way, uh, 
So the right hand side is in the right hand side is in say is in tension and the left hand side is in compression. So when wind is blowing in the, the other way, the then should be opposite, right? So uh, left hand side should be in should be in tension and right hand side should be in compression. So uh, the maximum tension and the compression should be 2520. So you have to check uh, for either as a compression member or as a tension member. Okay. okay. Uh, Another method to determine the internal forces in the collector would be a, a graph method. Okay. So method two would be using the graph. Okay. So draw the plan view. Draw the plan view. So you need to share in the diaphragm is 98 per linear foot and uh, the unit shear resisted by the shear wall is 224 PLF, right? So you have, and then we have to determine the, 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 the forces transferred by the collection by the collector. So uh, so we say uh, in this portion the diaphragm carried a say a negative A negative of two to four PLF and a positive uh, ninety eight PLF and the other side uh, the shear wall carried two to four PLF. Okay. So and they canceled out each other, so they the forces left are gonna be uh, canceled out. So 126 PLF was left on the both side of the uh, shear wall. F and in the middle, the linear load is going to be 98 PLF. Okay, so this linear foot. So, and then we want to calculate the force. So calculates the force. Uh, so the linear load on one end start, uh, is 126 PLF. So the force would be start 
from zero linearly increased to uh, 126 times 15, right? So you will get negative 1,890 pounds. And the other side, you start also from zero, okay? So, and increase to 126 times the length, which is 20, you get 2,520 pounds. And in between, there's no linear relationship. Okay. So the maximum tension and compression force would be 2,520 pounds. Okay. So this is the number this is the you this number you check used to check uh, either compression or tension. Right? Because if wind blow in the other way, it will switch to tension. It will switch to tension and compression. So this is gonna be the maximum tension and compression force. And then lastly, you determine the forces and you can use these forces to check the tension and compression. Okay. So next uh, is going to be the design of the splicing. So if you go back to So if you go back to look at the side view of the diaphragm, uh, the collectors are actually spliced, right? Because it, it, it might be impossible to to use a uh, use a single lumber to carry all these big forces, right? So it's better use the spliced collectors. So, uh, say splicing, splicing of collectors. Sometimes it's possible to find the to get the full continuous um, saw numbers. So splice has to be used. Say uh, the blue line is the uh, indicating the bolt. Okay, uh, and the red line indicating Splices. All right. Uh, so make sure at any cross section, at least the two layers are effective to carry the loads, especially carry the tension, tension forces. Okay. Uh, so
3, 2 by 6. Number 1, Douglas fir, large. Members are used. Um, and we use a single row of one inch diameter bolts. Uh, usually tension member controls uh, because uh, you don't have the uh, the tension tension capacity usually lower than the compression capacity and we usually assume the collectors are uh, continuously braced by the by the diaphragm okay, so usually the tension capacity will be lower than the compression capacity okay uh, Tension. Controls because uh, FT prime usually smaller than FC square uh, for. Uh, and and splices reduce effective tension area. So, for example, if, the, if this member is in tension, so at this core section, so only two layers are effective to resist the tension, right? But if it's in compression, you can consider, still consider that the three layers are resisting the compression at the same time. Okay, so the effective area for the tension would be at here would be two two times the uh, two times the cross section of the two by six lumber right but for the compression you can consider the area is three times the cross section of the two by six lumber okay. all right okay so then uh, after here
All right. Uh, so once we know that, then we can use the spreadsheets to check the tension and compression capacity of the cords and the collectors. Okay, so um, determine the core if the cords and the collectors are adequate for the maximum loading. Based on splicing, two of the two by six will be active at all times. Right, so we only count for two two by six numbers. Uh, assume the floor sheathing and shear walls providing continuous lateral bracing. So um, the C sub P is equal to one for compression members. Okay. Uh, all right, so determine the lumbar properties and the load. So uh, two is in a two by six, so T is 1.5, width is 5.5 for the single member. Uh, and so two members, right? So we consider two two by six lumbers are active. So the gross area would be two times the area. So two times T times W. Okay, the bow diameter is one inch. So the net area would be uh, the area, which is 16.5 minus by the two, two times the thickness, times the bolt diameter plus the whole, uh, the difference for the whole, so which is uh, the whole area, which is the diameter plus one sixteen, right? Uh, and the maximum tension member we calculated is ten point three kips. Okay, so if you go back to the notes, uh, we will know that. Uh, so the force in the cord when wind is blowing this way, so the force in the cord is 10.3. Okay, that should be the most critical times for the for the forces in the cord, right? So we use this. The, this should be the maximum forces in the cord for all possible scenarios. Okay, so check. Uh, Check tension or compression forces of 10.3 kips or 10,300 pounds. Uh, duration, so that's the wind for wind load. So duration factor is 1.6. Um, you have don't forget to apply for the size factor. So 1.3 for tension, 1.1 for compression. And the wood property, the reference design value for tension is 675 psi. Compression, 1,500 PSI. So uh, check tension, right? So uh, tension is the, uh, the force divided by the area. So E10 divided by B10. So E10, so it is the maximum tension force divided by the net area, right? So accounting for the two layers effective two layer effective area of the two layers right so and check the uh, the tension uh, tension so the design allowable design allowable tension design value would be the reference tension value times 1.6 times 1.3 which is equal to which is equal to 1,404 PSI. And also remember to check the compression. So the compression, actual applied compression stress is the same as the uh, applied tension stress because they have the same uh, force values and the same net areas. Uh, design value are a little bit different. Okay? As we can see, that's the design compression stress are almost two times as the allowable tension stress, right? So tension is more critical, okay? Um, crushing controls because uh, we can assume it's continu continuously braced by the, by, the, uh, by the sheeting, all right? So that should be uh, the, uh, the cover the almost all, most of the uh, design value.
the design procedures. Uh, next time, we're going to talk about the diffraction uh, and the uh, tie and anchorage force uh, design. Okay, so thank you for watching.